production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Nicolette Jaworski, Director of External Affairs for AT&T and a proud City Club member. I'm honored to introduce today's speaker, the Honorable Nan Whaley, Mayor of Dayton, Ohio. This is the second time Mayor Whaley has been at the City Club stage. Her first appearance was two years ago during her campaign for Governor of Ohio. A lot has changed in those two years and throughout her time as mayor. First elected in 2013, Mayor Whaley became a visible leader throughout her city and the greater region, spearheading an education overhaul, taking on the op opioid crisis, and leading one of the most complicated projects in Dayton's history, the redevelopment of the Dayton Arcade. But then she was thrust into the national spotlight for her leadership in guiding the city through a series of challenges, a clash between white supremacists and counter-protesters, a series of tornadoes that caused catastrophic damage, and a mass shooting that resulted in nine deaths and a visit from President Donald Trump. Through her city's grief, Mayor Whaley has emerged as a leading voice for gun control, calling on lawmakers to strengthen laws on straw purchases and background checks. To her, these actions are part of her larger philosophy, articulated in a recent Washington Post article. Quote, the office of mayor should matter to the community in times of joy, and especially in times of grief. Today she'll share the challenges of leadership in times of unimaginable crisis, and why she still believes in the re resiliency and grit of Dayton and its residents. Originally from Indiana, Ms. Whaley moved to Ohio to attend the University of Dayton, earning a chemistry degree in 1998. She became active in local politics, creating the University of Dayton College Democrat chapter and then became the executive director of the Montgomery County Democratic Party in 1997. In 2005, Ms. Whaley became the youngest woman elected to the Dayton City Commission. She served two terms before deciding to run for mayor, a decision that she ruminated over for two years. In 2017, she was re-elected mayor without opposition, a first in Dayton's history. Mayor Whaley is also a leader among her peers, serving as second vice president for the US Conference of Mayors, the official nonpartisan organization of cities with populations over 30,000. And she's a founding board member for the Ohio Mayor's Alliance, a bipartisan coalition of Ohio's 30 largest cities. Esteemed guests, members and friends of the City Club, please join me in welcoming to the stage my friend, Mayor Nan Whaley. That's so great. Isn't this crazy? <laughs> Why is this crazy? Thanks, Nikki. On August 4th, at about 4 a.m., I woke up to a knock at my front door. I went downstairs thinking it may be a neighbor who needed help. Instead, it was a city attorney who told me there had just been a mass shooting in our city. A gunman had opened fire in Dayton's crowded Oregon district. His military-style weapon allowed him to kill nine people and wound, wound 40 more in less than one minute. A month earlier, also in Dayton, a woman was killed by her partner in front of dozens of people in a dollar store parking lot. She had filed a restraining order against him a few days before, but there was no process compelling him to turn over his gun. And last month, Dayton Police Detective George Del Rio, a 30-year veteran of the force and father of five, was shot and killed while serving a search warrant on a DEA raid. He, he was shot by a man with 10 kilos of deadly fentanyl who was not legally allowed to possess a gun, but had bought one illegally through a straw purchaser. One of these shootings made national news. The other two, sadly, have become routine. All three of these shootings represent a crisis of gun violence in our community 
that has continued unabated for years as politicians in Washington and Columbus refuse to take action. Like so many other communities across our country, Dayton bears the brunt of this national failure. But the thing is, this is what we've come to expect in Dayton. To borrow a phrase from my good friend Sherrod Brown, Dayton is the canary in the coal mine. So often in our history, we have been at the forefront of the issues facing our nation. But with that struggle, I believe comes a unique opportunity to set an example for our state and for our country. Dayton's history is one of innovation. We've changed the world before we can do it again. People move to Dayton for opportunity. For decades, places like Dayton provided the backbone of the American middle class through good paying jobs that required little more than a solid work ethic and a strong body. Immigrants from abroad and migrants from Appalachia and the Jim Crow South made Dayton their home, enriching our community in countless ways. Dayton was home to companies like National Cash Register that excelled at the world stage. Through much of the 20th century, places like Dayton and all of Ohio, like most of the country, saw rapid growth in their middle class through good work in factories, and local executives became civic leaders investing in our communities. But we all know where the story goes from there. Since the 1970s, we've seen globalization and automation decimate our local economies. Forces far beyond the control of local workers and leaders closed factories and sent good paying jobs out of town. Dayton began to hollow out because of policy choices made far away from City Hall. By the early 2000s, after vulture capitalists gutted our manufacturing industry, they looked to fleece our homeowners as well. They preyed on folks' drive to achieve the American dream, especially African Americans, with high interest predatory mortgages. The foreclosure crisis that would eventually rock our nation in 2008 was felt years earlier in Dayton. With the jobs moving out, the opioids moved in, Dayton was ground zero for the shady practices of big drug companies pushing addictive pills. It was only a matter of time before heroin moved in next. By 2017, Montgomery County had one of the highest opioid death rates in the country. Just this summer, we've been hit again and again with national crises that have gone untreated. On Mo Memorial Day weekend, a group of white supremacists held a rally in our city trying to incite hatred and fear. After Charlottesville, we could not take any chances and had to shut down our entire downtown to avoid violence. Less than 48 hours later, for the first time in history, dozens of tornadoes ripped through our community, flattening neighborhoods and businesses. Extreme weather events caused by climate change had come to Dayton. And you all know that in August, Dayton became the latest city to join the unfortunate list of communities ripped apart by a senseless mass shooting. It has been a hell of a year in Dayton. In fact, it's been a hell of a 50 years. But I don't say this for your sympathy, far from it. Dayton has always risen to the challenge posed by crisis. And this is not the first time tragedy has threatened to destroy my community. During Easter weekend in March 1913, the already saturated levees holding back the swollen Great Miami River finally gave way. Parts of the city were under 20 feet of water. To this day, if you look up at the streetlights and buildings downtown, there are still signs showing the high water marks. As the water rose, families were forced to their attics for safety. They sat in the dark, praying for deliverance and promising that they would help rebuild the city and ensure that a catastrophe like this never happened again. When the flood receded several days later, hundreds of people were dead and 65,000 had lost their home. City leaders led a massive campaign to rebuild the city and keep such a flood from ever happening again. 
their rallying cry was, remember the promises you made in the attic. Today, our city is flooded once again. Our whole country is. White supremacy, climate change, gun violence, economic inequality. When politicians in Columbus and Washington refuse to deal with these problems, folks in Dayton feel the impact. But in Dayton and in Ohio, we do not run away from our problems. After the 1913 flood, our community built a massive flood control system that kept our city safe for over 100 years. That system became the model for the Tennessee Valley Authority and similar systems across the country and around the world. Instead of shying away from the hard work of fixing their city, the community came together. They kept the promises they made in the attic. They kept the promises they made in a crisis. Today, we must do the same. This summer has made it so clear to me that national issues have real impacts on local communities. The president's tweets aren't a joke anymore when the KKK shows up in your town. Climate change doesn't seem like some future threat when you walk past houses reduced to rubble. Gun violence stops being some cheap political debate when you comfort a family who has lost a son, lost a daughter, to a senseless mass shooting. When a flood destroyed our city, folks in Dayton couldn't count on anyone else but them to rebuild and protect their community. So they did it themselves. The same is true today. This is what I've learned this summer as mayor. We can't wait for anyone else to solve our problems. We have seen white supremacy become increasingly acceptable at the highest level of the United States, even by the president. What these people want is to divide us. We refuse to let that happen in Dayton. We welcome and value folks like Detective George Del Rio who emigrated from Mexico as a child and joined our police force as a drug detective. As Governor DeWine said at his funeral, our country is better for having him chosen to be here. Even in his final act, he likely saved hundreds of lives by helping to keep more fentanyl off our streets. Dayton is a welcoming city. No matter where you're from, who you love, or what you believe, you are welcome in Dayton. And I don't think that is such a crazy idea. So when the white supremacists came to town in May, we did not let them divide us. We brought our community together to have the real and tough conversation about the legacy of racism in our city and how we can continue to work past it together. But the hate group's visit reminds us that there is still so much more to be done. In Dayton and nationwide, we need to be painfully honest about how opportunity is distributed among racial lines. Dayton is still too segregated and too unequal, and that has to change. Even before the hate group rally, we were focusing on identifying and dismantling systems that keep people trapped in poverty, especially African Americans. This includes big issues like addressing evictions that make families and neighborhoods less stable, and small issues like streamlining our car towing process. The tornadoes showed that we can't ignore the very real threat of climate change. The millions of dollars in destruction we're still cleaning up in Dayton has made it clear that this is not something we can put off in dealing with any longer. While politicians in Washington block any action on climate change, and our own state government guts our renewable energy industry, Dayton and other cities are entering into a new climate pact to lead on emission reductions. If the state and federal governments won't lead, cities will. When I took office as mayor, it felt like Dayton had just been pushed out of a plane. Dayton was in free fall. National issues rocked our community. We were still dealing with the many impacts of the Great Recession, including widespread unemployment, 
a decimated real estate market, and extremely limited financial resources. The addiction crisis that gripped Dayton's, Dayton compounded those challenges, requir requiring an all-hands-on-deck approach. But rather than fight against one another with divisive rhetoric, folks in Dayton came together to turn our city around. And in doing so, we're building something better than the past. We've seen significant economic growth, with nearly a billion dollars in completed investment product projects since I took office in 2014. Another $210 million worth of projects are underway, including major infrastructure investments in our neighborhoods. But more importantly, we're doubling down on our investments in our residents from all corners of the city. We've enacted progressive policies to support working families. We were proud to become the first major Ohio city to offer paid parental leave for municipal employees, improving economic security for our new parents. We have aggressively focused on ensuring that all of our children have access to educational opportunities that will prepare them for the workplace of the future. In 2016, on the night that Donald Trump won Ohio, Dayton voters approved a plan to fund access to high quality preschool for every four-year-old in our city. <laughs> Although Dayton was hit hard by the opioid crisis and a rash of overdose deaths, our city has proven to be extraordinarily resilient in the face of this crisis. In fact, Dayton has become a model for other communities in our response. I often say that I want Dayton to be known as the place that figured out how to move past the stigma of addiction and instead treat it like the disease that it is. Due to the great work of leaders from across our community, I am so proud to say that overdose deaths were cut in half last year. That is over 200 lives saved in our city. It has been four months since the Oregon District shooting. An incredibly difficult four months. But I am so proud of Dayton. What I've been most proud of is our community's commitment to enacting real change. When Governor Mike DeWine took the stage at a vigil hours after the shooting, Hundreds of people shouted in frustration, do something, do something. I'm happy to be working with Governor DeWine and other Democrats and Republicans to pass real, impactful gun safety reforms in Ohio. I have made it clear to the governor that I think there are things in this bill that needs to change, and I know that it does not go far enough to end gun violence in our communities. But this is an important first step. And if the legislature refuses to act, then we will take the issue directly to voters with a ballot initiative. And there are, <clears throat> and there will be some amazing Moms Demand Action folks encouraging you to sign as you leave. <laughs> as our city has endured horrible times this summer, we have learned about each other and what is most important to us. People who never would have crossed paths have helped each other in our most painful moments. The weekend after the tornadoes, thousands of people with rakes and shovels, whatever they could find in their garage, volunteered to clean up neighborhoods that were not their own. Within days of the shooting, the Oregon District was covered in small, handmade signs of encouragement. Tens of thousands of people came out to a benefit concert raising money for the victims' families. And just a few weeks ago, schools and businesses throughout the county closed early so that mourners could line up for miles along the funeral procession route for Detective Del Rio. This has been the hardest year of my life to witness so much pain. But it has been amazing to also see so much beauty from my community's response. Dayton has done what Dayton does best. We took care of each other. When you're the mayor of the city, no matter the size, you don't have the luxury of looking away. This is especially true in a city like Dayton, 
I spend hours every week responding to emails from our residents on issues big and small. I recently went to get my hair cut and my stylist told me that another one of her clients had lobbied her to pass along a particular complaint. <laughs> In politics, there's often a disincentive to actually get things done. It's easier to blame the other side when problems persist. But in cities, we're focused on problem solving, not scoring points. Legislators in Washington and Columbus can kick the can down the road and say, that's not my problem. But when potholes don't get filled, believe me, that is the mayor's problem. <laughs> when opioids ravage your city, that's the mayor's problem. When a shooter opens fire in a crowded neighborhood, that's the mayor's problem. The most innovative leaders in public service that I know today, both Democrats and Republicans, are mayors all over this country. I'm honored to serve as the second vice president of the US Conference of Mayors, so I've gotten to see this amazing work firsthand. While gridlock shuts down progress at so many levels of government, we must look to mayors as future leaders of this country. We're in a golden age of local leadership as much by necessity as by choice. Without leaders in Washington or Columbus, our most pressing problems are being solved at the local level. Creative ideas and lessons in failure are being shared around the country. Cities are acting as laboratories for ingenuity that our country so desperately needs. I'm so proud about what we have accomplished in Dayton, both this summer and over the past six years. But none of this happened overnight. We have spent years building a team of leaders who live up to our city's history of ingenuity. When I first ran for mayor, I like to say that the mayor of Dayton should matter. Before I announced my candidacy, I spent months talking to folks in the community, business owners, activists, elected officials, clergy, labor leaders, what I realized was that our city was reacting to events rather than setting its own course. I refuse to let our city or our future be defined by anyone but ourselves. For too long, leaders in Dayton and other older industrial cities across the country had stood by and let their communities be swept up by national events. Dayton was at a crossroads. We could continue to manage our decline or we could rise to the occasion. So we got to work. When you lead a city like Dayton, you don't have the biggest staff or the most resources. So what that means is we have to be scrappy. We have to be gritty. We have to be resilient. We have to embody the very traits that make our city so great. And that's all been on display in spades this year. While we may lack resources at City Hall, we do have the ability to create a culture and build a team that can make our city succeed. Every one of the successes I have talked about here today, every single one of them, would not have been successful if we did not have the right team in place. Without a creative team of education researchers and leaders, we would never have been able to expand preschool to every four-year-old in the city. In just over two years, we have given hundreds of Dayton children new educational opportunities, and the data shows that our investment is already paying dividends. Without innovative public health and safety officials, we could never have cut the overdose rate in half. If you overdose in Dayton, our first reaction isn't to put you in jail. It is to put you in touch with treatment services available to you, including life-saving Medicaid expansion. By treating this crisis as a public health issue, rather than just a criminal justice problem, we have learned to break the cycle of addiction and broken families. Without fearless, compassionate first responders and dedicated city staff, we could never have begun to heal after the Oregon District shooting. I have thought a lot about the bravery of our Dayton police. When they heard gunfire, they rushed towards it neutralizing the gunmen, and then immediately worked to save the lives of those who had been injured. 
Our city staff then worked around the clock to accomplish the Herculean task of organizing vigils and events, providing support, particularly mental health services, to all those impacted, and doing everything else they could to make our community feel safe again. The list goes on and on and on. All of this takes trust. Trust that our team at City Hall is up for any challenge. Trust that our community leaders are committed to our city. Trust that our residents will give us the grace to try and sometimes fail. This is the only way to keep pushing ahead. While people and resources settle into fewer and fewer places, we in Dayton must instead rely on nurturing our own talent to foster creativity and risk taking. This is how we keep moving forward, no matter the challenge. In cities like Dayton, it's easy to focus on what was and what we don't have. Easy to be held back by our past. Easy to say we just want to make America great again. But we don't have the time to focus on what is behind us or where we should place the blame for our current situations. Instead, we have to do the real and hard work of figuring out where we go from here. In times like these, doing something hard is an act of hope. After the year we've had in Dayton, it is easy to want to retreat or to fail to keep our promises. But that simply isn't an option for us. On August 3rd, Lois Oglesby went to meet friends in the Oregon District. It was her first time going out since her daughter was born a few months earlier. Her evening of celebration abruptly turned to tragedy as the gunman's shots ran out. In her last moments, Lois wasn't thinking of herself. She was thinking of her family. She called her partner to ask him to make sure her children knew what they surely already did, that she loved them more than anything. It now falls on every one of us to build the community that will raise Lois's children. We owe it to them to keep the promises we made during this crisis. We owe it to them to keep moving forward. We owe it to them to do something. We owe it to them to do something. I'll happily take questions now. I'm Dan Malthrop, uh, CEO here at the City Club, grateful that there was that standing ovation so I could compose myself before reading the script. Today we're, with, <laughs> we're hearing from the Honorable Nan Whaley, Mayor of Dayton, Ohio, and we're about to begin the Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via our radio broadcast on WCPN or our live stream. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will work it into the program. Holding our microphones today, our content and Program Coordinator Bliss Davis, and Director of Programming Stephanie Jansky. May we have our first question, please? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hi, good hi. afternoon. Oh, Over here. Hi. <laughs> uh, my name is Merle Johnson. I'm a member of the Ohio Board of Education, and and you named a number of ills, national ills, uh, that are having an impact everywhere. You mentioned um, gun violence, white supremacy, economic inequality. <coughs> climate change, but one of, the, list, yeah. one of the ills that doesn't get mentioned, uh -huh. not even in the, the debates on TV, is the national movement to privatize public schools. Mm -hmm. And school vouchers started in Cleveland in 1995, and now they're affecting almost everybody. And it reminds me of the poem by the pastor that said, when they came for Cleveland, I did not speak out. Mm -hmm. And now they're coming for a lot of districts. Uh, the voucher expansions is mm -hmm. allowing children to leave public schools, 
go to private religious schools, even students who have never been in that public school. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a hastening of the school to prison pipeline. So the reason I bring that up, uh, Mayor Bailey, is because when charters first hit, hit the picture, Dayton was one of the first earliest districts that had schools closing. Correct. And so I'm just wondering if you would talk about the impact that school privatization has had on Dayton. Right, so you know, you talk about Cleveland and Dayton were really the first ones that had this voucher and uh, charter issue. And um, certainly I think there was two things going on in Dayton, and I, you know, it was before I was in leadership, even at City Hall when, the, when this moved, so I only know the history, not the time during it. But I think there were two places. One was well-intentioned people frustrated with the process and people that believed, uh, and the second group, people that wanted to make money off of our kids. Uh, and, you know, um, kind of an unholy alliance that came together, and it's had uh, dramatic effects for Dayton. Uh, one out of three kids now in the city of Dayton do not go to Dayton public schools. And so can you imagine uh, the 20,000 children across the city, I think, go to, I think the number is right now 64 schools. And these schools open and close ad nauseum. There's no continuancy and no sustainability around the charter system. And it creates uneasiness and unsustainability in the public school system as well. We've seen no leadership from the state from this. Again, um, I think those that constructed the charter school process would say that they've made a mistake. I've heard some of them privately say that today. It's nice of them 20 years later to finally admit that privately. Um, but we, you know, we really need a couple of things, I think, around it, like heavier regula regulations. And you know people start talking about this in the State House. I know Nikki Antonia is here, great leader in this work. And then um, the money comes in and then the stops. I mean, the charter system in, in Ohio is so bad that the charter leaders in the country think Ohio is bad. So um, this is just another example of the lack of leadership we're seeing in the State House and how money is taking over the system of our state control. It's up to us, local communities, to talk about this. And, you know, unfortunately, since it's happening to more wealthy communities now, I think the voice maybe get louder than just the poor communities. Uh, but we all need to stand up and say, like, listen, there needs to be thoughtfulness and regulations around what's happening with our school children. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership on these <coughs> important issues and especially reaching out beyond Dayton. Uh, well, we I really love to come to Cleveland, that. so <laughs> it's my fave. So my question is, uh, who do you support uh, in the upcoming presidential election? Oh. And if you're- What and, a nice softball. And, and why? And if you're not ready to make that Oh, commitment. no, I'll tell you. Yeah. OK, good. <laughs> well, so the important part to that question is why? Sure. Uh, so uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I support heartily, full-throatedly uh, Pete Buttigieg for president of the United States. And uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, number one, um, uh, I um, had met Pete actually two weeks after I was elected mayor in 2014. I'd heard about him in 2010. My, you know, I'm originally from Indiana. My mother loves to follow politics. I go home one day and she said, oh, there's this really smart guy running for state treasurer. He's like 28 years old. He doesn't have a prayer because I can't even say his name. <laughs> and uh, it was Buttigieg. And, uh, I, and, you know, when I was running for mayor, a lot of people in Ohio had worked for him in Indiana and said, oh, you've got to meet my friend Pete. So two weeks after I was elected, I was at U.S. Conference of Mayors and met him and certainly understood what they were talking about. He's far and away the smartest human I've ever met. Uh, it's, it's more about how, wh how well he is able to retain knowledge, but then also be curious and know that more people can teach him no matter what. He's an insatiable learner. Uh, he understands the plight of mid-sized cities, which is obviously a very big passion of mine, being the mayor of South Bend. Um, he's a veteran, uh, and um, I think he is speaking about faith in a way that nobody in the pre Democratic presidential bay has really handled. I think that makes him a very special candidate. He has his challenges. All candidates do. I went to New Hampshire for him for two weeks ago. It was uh, invigorating to see um, people in New Hampshire for him. I'll be going to Iowa for him as well. Um, and I think that it's time to have a mayor in the White House since that's the only place anything's getting done is in cities. So uh, I'm excited to be supporting him. I hope you all will give him a look. Uh, I will say that I'm for any Democratic nominee that wins through this process. We must win in November and we'll do everything in my power to make sure that happens. Uh, well, speaking of politics, uh, we really, really need your leadership uh, in the governor's mansion. <laughs> and where, 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 where were you in 17 or 18? Yeah. I was behind you. 
Uh, where can we send a check, or how can we support uh, your campaign for governor in 2022? Well, uh, I don't know about that. My husband Sam's with me here, and I never mentioned Sam, but I'm uh, super grateful for... Uh, I would never have gotten through anything without Sam through the past six years, but certainly not this past year. And so I'm so glad that he made the trip up. Uh, and we made a deal that we're not making any decision uh, this year because I have to tell you, after this year, the only thing I'm wishing is for the end of 2019. <laughs> and so uh, we'll make that decision in the coming years. Uh, for me, the, again, the presidential race is so important and so critical for the future of Ohio and the future of this country. I'll be putting my effort there politically. I uh, appreciate people's interest, and people have a lot of ideas of what I should do, and appreciate yours. Um, uh, but you know, uh, I'm like I'm praying to get to 2019 quietly, out of 2019 quietly, and win the pre help and win the presidency in 20 right now. Mayor, it's good to see Hi, you. Hi, Nan. It's good to see you. I'm Carol Rowe, Mayor of Cleveland Heights. How do you respond to those people who say? that the governor's proposal regarding gun violence just is not enough and they can't support it or do anything to be helpful. Right, thank you. This is a tough uh, issue, right? Because of course, uh, I would like the proposal to go way further than the governor thinks he can get through the legislature. Uh, and I think the governor would like it to go further too, frankly, uh, because his 17 point pay plan he announced was way further than what he proposed. Uh, the mayors across the state have really spent a lot of time thinking about this, and we have a position, and it is a position of this. If a, if a, if a legislative action will save a life, we're going to be for it. And while this is a small step, there are steps in this that are really important, and we look at this gun violence prevention issue as a movement, much like the movement for uh, equality, gay rights, so, uh, uh, voting rights, civil rights, you take the steps in the, in the movement towards it. And so these steps are important, um, particularly for everyday gun violence that's happening in our communities is, is attached in this issue. Uh, and we will support it because it will save lives. Uh, and then we want it to pass, and then we, we support the ballot initiative for universal background checks, and we want to make that happen, since nine out of 10 Ohioans agree with us that we need universal background checks. So this is one piece and one movement. And um, considering, um, particularly mayors are interested in the business of governing. We like to see ways that we can have wins and move forward. And um, I, there was an election in 2018 in Ohio in November, and we lost as, as uh, progressives. And so we have to take the wins where we can get it. If we had won, this would be a different conversation completely. It's not. And so I, you know, we have to figure out ways that we can take steps forward. And I hope that um, other folks in the movement come with us on it. There's been hard, hardly disagreement, but I know the Ohio mayors uh, will be pushing hard and continuing to push hard. And I appreciate the support of the Ohio mayors that's been so steadfast with the, with the belief that if it saves a life, we're gonna, we're gonna be for it. Thanks for the question. Hi, Leslie Unger. Hi, Leslie. I'm, hi there. I'm curious, um, in the, uh, during his visit and in the aftermath, we all hear a lot about this president. We all hear a lot from this president. I'm curious what, things happened that you would have expected and what things might have happened that you didn't expect either during the visit or in the aftermath of the visit? Well, first I want to say I would not have gotten through the 72 hours of the Donald Trump visit without United States Senator Sherrod Brown. <laughs> um, now you all, you all are, um, in Northeast Ohio, where progressives are aplenty. You, can, you even have enough to fight with each other. Um, <laughs> I'm down in Dayton, okay? So I am uh, surrounded by people that don't necessarily have my thought process. And uh, uh, when the president said he was coming, Sherrod immediately said, I'm not coming. And then I called and said, please, I need you to come. And he said, okay, I'll come. Uh, and that was very important. I mean, if you can imagine, for me, this was, very, this was a very hard part of it, right? I don't agree with this president. I think what he has done has been harmful to our country. I've been vocal about that. But he sits in the office of the presidency. Uh, and so I respect that office. And I also live in a county that voted for Obama twice and then voted for Trump. So I also am trying to keep a community together 
uh, and a person that won the county by like 500 votes, so people have an opinion of Donald Trump, really different opinions, 50-50, is going to come in. And so, you know, my focus was about how I could keep my community together, and that's how I just kept my eye on the ball about that and where the president could come that could add value. Governor DeWine was very helpful in this process as well um, because I did not want the president to go to the Oregon District, mostly because the owners, the business owners of the Oregon District called me and said, please, don't let the president come to the Oregon District. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, you know, I called the governor and asked him and said, listen, can you talk to the White House because this will be detrimental to my community. He can come to the, the hospital, the people in the hospital want to see him, he can add value there. And uh, the governor helped with that and that's what happened. Um, you know, it still required the mayor to be there for three hours while he was visiting everyone. And thank you again to Sherrod for being there too. Um, and it was a surreal experience, you know, he's someone that lacks empathy. Uh, and, um, and you know you don't normally see that in your leaders. You, leaders typically have empathy, and so it's hard. It's hard to witness, um, and it's also, frankly, hard to see people that really, really love him. And there are people in Dayton that do. Uh, and then you know you have such a different view of that, right? I do at least. And then you know finally the most surreal part was when he decided to tweet um, something that frankly never happened. And you know he has his own reality, and you know I recognize that, and recognize that now with every tweet and being a part of and experiencing, you know, being in his alternate universe. Uh, was uh, very, uh, uh, something I'll probably never have to go through again, and I'm happy for. But um, uh, Mayor Cranley, the mayor of Cincinnati, called me immediately after the president tweeted, and he said, well, uh, they're going to call you. I don't know how John knows these things. They're going to call you. You'll, you'll, you're going to immediately need, they're going to have uh, security detail on you, because I pretty much travel alone. I was like, I don't think so. Oh, no. Like, you know, they're, they're going to come and try to kill you. And sure enough, like, within, like, six, six, six hours, the Dayton police was like, oh, we have to have security detail on you. So, I mean, his, his, his followers are very, I've never really experienced anything like his followers, much less him. So, it was illuminating. Hello, my name is Margaret Gray, and I and my co-teacher are here with a group of 27 energetic high school students. And I wanted to ask you, do you have suggestions for ways that young people can directly engage in an effective way with their local and city governments? So first, let me say, I, I just came from a new mayor's school at Harvard uh, this week, and they always give a um, poll of 18 to 29-year-olds and what 18 to 29-year-olds are thinking, and I've you know, fully believe, <clears throat> thought this before seeing this, what um, they were thinking, but I, I think they're going to save our country. So thank you in advance. <laughs> <clears throat> the vote of 18 to 29 year olds in the midterms was like as best as it was in like in, the, in one of the presidentials and so I think that that excitement about taking back the country and what uh, young people's values are are very different than uh, the older generation and we're seeing that on display over and over again in all kinds of races and so a couple of things I would suggest number one um, soon you know if you're in high school soon you'll be able to vote and um, organizing to be ready for your first vote is, I think, a big deal. In Dayton, we actually um, have uh, the elected officials of both parties come together. Uh, they have, um, we go and register people in the senior classes, and then they actually all come together and take buses and vote together, early vote, and walk across a bridge uh, because uh, so many people have fought for this right. And so the first vote, we want to be special and meaningful. And so the community comes to like welcome the 18 year olds to the vote. I would suggest you guys look into that. All cities should do that. A uh, way to celebrate our democratic right. Uh, so that's a way to organize uh, for high school students. Uh, and then also, if you know you're very excited, I think the first time uh, I walked for a candidate, I was probably 12 or 13 or 14. Uh, you know, go get involved. This is going to be a great year. There's tons of candidates. Like, young people are what drive campaigns and you don't have to vote to volunteer and so if people are interested in doing that find the candidate you love go and put time into it you'll learn a lot about your democracy and you'll be a part of it even before you have the right to say something and the vote so those would be my suggestions thank you hi i'm liz how can communities impact a reduction in gun violence, especially related to the legislation that the governor is backing and separately the bipartisan relation, uh, legislation that is in the Senate right now? Uh, so first, I think 
you know, what we're witnessing, I, I always say if, if we solve the issue of gun violence in the state legislatures, then we've solved the issue of extreme dollars and extreme money and uh, extreme actions in the legislature, right? Because, you know, if you look at the, what the Ohio, Ohioans want, they want what, you know, we're advocating for. They want universal background checks, the majority want an assault weapons ban or a, a ban on uh, extended magazines. You know, these are the things the most Ohioans agree on. So a lot of this has to do with how gerrymandered and extreme the legislature is. So the work gets deeper than just a simple issue. So I think uh, from like Moms Demand, you saw their action in Virginia was really changing the face of the state legislature in a more deeper way than just around gun violence. So I think that's one a effort. The second thing locally, there's a lot of work we can do because what happens, and I try to make this point in the speech, is we get a lot of attention around the mass shootings. But for a mayor, and if you're in a city, if you're a councilman in Griffin, this is an everyday occurrence for us. Um, and it's become way, way, way too normal for our communities. And we've seen an uptick in all cities across the country of about 20% across this past year in this gun violence issue. And it's not the mass shootings. They get attention, but it's really this everyday gun violence. So in Dayton, we have um, started, we got a, um, a work, we started this year to start thinking about gun violence as a public health issue and how we can really engage in our neighborhoods where we have higher gun violence issues to start having the conversations that, again, go deeper than just gun violence. Uh, so, you know, we have to do these, like, all at the same time. We have to limit the access to guns. There's too many guns, so that's the work we're doing, trying to do on universal background checks and trying to do around the assault weapons ban and extended magazines. We have to, you know, then work in our communities to say, okay, what's going on here and why did you choose to solve your problems through a gun? And then we have to also, uh, you know, start, I mean, legally fighting the gun industry, which cities are doing uh, as well. So we like, we actually have a table we've put together where um, people that are interested in this work across the state are coming in to say, okay, what are we legally doing? What are we advocating? And, you know, how can we start um, legislatively changing? And so we're thinking of it in those three ways. Again, this is a movement. This isn't something we're going to get done. I wish, I wish, you know, something happened. And it's heartbreaking to me that nothing happened right after Dayton. You know, every city that goes through this hopes that they're the city that wakes people up to, like, what are we doing? Um, but we will continue to fight on that way around this issue because every day in America, 100 people lose their lives to a gun, most of them through suicide. But if they didn't have access to the gun, it would be very much more difficult to, to kill yourself. You might hurt yourself, but it's the, true, uh, it's the best way to kill yourself. And so that's the work that we have underway in cities across the country. Mayor Whaley. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi. I'm Minister Robert Earl Sappho. I'd like to be pastor. called Brother Bob because I'm a real live brother. <laughs> I have to commend you and congratulate you on your presentation. Thank you. It gives me hope for the city of Cleveland and other so-called middle-sized cities. I would hope that other mayors, including our own mayor, would be here like Brother Griffin here, who's probably going to be our next mayor, and this is the flood. <laughs> Not just because he's from Youngstown from Warren either, but I'll kind of be brief as I can. But in 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in April. In May, I was appointed the Human Relations Director for Trumbull County, okay. when Warren is the county seat. That was that came after and the riots broke out at one yarding high school where I was a graduate uh, like 25 years prior to. And the kids were demanding some accountability from the school system. One of the things they demanded was the black history in the schools. One of the people that uh, spoke out against kids coming together was, a, 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 they call it, excuse the expression, U.S., Virginia, Kentucky people, hillbillies that moved there recently. He was the assistant principal at the high school. He said all black kids ought to be back in Africa. The kids demanded that he be fired. Okay, but during that time, from May the 29th through uh, September the 7th, I pulled together a group of young people at the local gymnasium where I was training amateur fighters, and they just, I was the only adult in the group. As you guys bring me a seven uh, point program that you want, they, made, but they brought by eight. But the most important ones was they demanded that black history be taught. Great. And that was done. So all the seven proposals they brought uh, went into fruition. Great. But the model for our program came up from the Dune Human Relations Commission, okay? And I don't have seen that, have a question, okay? Why do you think that people, uh, like uh, right in this room, this is a very diverse group, handsome group, <laughs> why aren't they more involved, okay, in, in getting involved in the areas that you're talking about? Now, Dayton has always been at the pinnacle of, uh, you know, moving forward 
the Cleveland even more so, mm -hmm. but we've receded in the past mm -hmm. few years. Mm -hmm. What can we do to get the people galvanized to get involved like you are? Thank you. Uh, thanks for your great work and your leadership too, uh, Pastor. Appreciate it. Uh, this is tough work, and I think um, we're seeing in cities across the country a real discussion around equity and inclusion and what uh, that means and how that's actually better for our communities if we do that. And so I would, you know, I think that the, the, the conversations that are happening here at the City Club and across the city, and I'm sure as uh, council races and mayor's races, as you mentioned, heat up, this conversation will start um, having again. And it's an important time and an, an important um, time for cities to have that conversation. So I would encourage a couple of things. I'm sure uh, in, in Dayton we have the Human Relations Commission, HRC, like most cities do. Encourage engagement in that. Uh, encourage your city to become a welcoming community. I know Joe Simperman's doing great work about being an immigrant-friendly city. Uh, you know, this is, uh, for Ohio, we need to be deeper than just, you know, white issues and African-American issues. It's got to be more diversity and more places more often for us to really continue to be at the forefront of issues that are affecting our country, and we're getting behind. Uh, Dayton still has a lot of work to do on this, right? We are still, we have still huge issues about um, I-75 and this systemic racism that has existed in our community, but you have to say it to then claim it to work on it. And so that's what I try to do and we'll continue. So we're, we're not, we don't have it figured out yet, um, but we know that we have issues and we've got to keep on working on it. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Mayor, for a very thoughtful speech Thank and you. answers to questions. I want to ask you about what may be more of a hidden issue, but also requires a movement. And that is that we all work so hard to register more voters and young voters, but the people purging other voters from the rolls are purging faster than we're registering. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that dilemma? Yeah, so this is an issue that's happening nationwide again, and it's systemic. And I, I look a lot to like, um, I think, I think uh, Stacey Abrams' group has said a million people have been purged in Dayton, I mean, in Ohio, not in Dayton, thank God, and a million across the state this past, uh, this past few years. Uh, I think uh, we need to have, uh, like, my big, my big complaint of the progressive movement is we want, like, fast moves, quickly solved, and move on to the next thing. And the conservative movement is much more patient than we are. Uh, and so we have a tendency to think, oh, we just elected Barack Obama, everything is fine. And you can see that there were all these other systems in place that will allow whoever we lead, and the presidency is very important, that we don't make these systemic changes. And um, you saw that particularly in our, and just how tough our state legislat legislatures are across the country. So I'm excited about, for example, the work that Eric Holder's team is doing around redistricting and paying attention to the redistricting effort. It's not something that will just be solved, but it's something we have to look at long term. The same is true about voting rights. You know, um, I, I forget it was one corrupt politician that said something. I don't care who votes; I care who counts the vote. I think I can't remember. It's probably from Chicago. I'm sure, but <laughs> <coughs> just kidding, just kidding. Uh, and so we have to be. We have to pay very close attention to this, right? Because it's also about registering, and this is an old game. You know, this was a game we fought in the 60s, right, to say everybody gets a vote. And now it's like, well, let's make it a paper process and make it very difficult. So the real way to solve this is, you know, automatic voter registration, same-day voter registration. We see that that increases the number of people that turn out in states like Oregon and Wisconsin. And really, uh, we have to make sure that we fight this conversation all around, like every person, one person, one vote. It's this, the steadfastness of our Constitution, of what our Constitution means to us today, and what we need to continue to move forward. But you take your eyes off of it for one minute, a million people are pur purged in, in the state of Ohio. So I appreciate people that are paying attention to that issue. Obviously, we have lots of issues to deal with. Mayor Whaley just asked me, was that all right? <laughs> Please. Mayor Whaley.
And today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been hearing from the Honorable Nan Whaley, Mayor of Dayton, Ohio. Our forum today is part of our Urban Leadership Series sponsored by AT&T. We're delighted to have Nikki Jaworski of AT&T uh, and her guests with us today. Thank you for your continued support of City Club programming. Community partners for our forum today are the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland and the Ray C. Bliss Institute of Applied Politics at the University of Akron. Additionally, we welcome guests at tables hosted by Bank of America, Burgess and Burgess Strategists, the Cuyahoga County, the Cuyahoga Democratic Women's Caucus, guests of Paul Clark, and guests of Nan Whaley. And lastly, we welcome students from Hawkins School. Support for student participation comes from many forum, many uh, foundations, including the William M. Weiss Foundational Foundation, with additional support from donors you'll find listed in today's program. We're happy to have you here. And if you enjoyed today's forum, please consider joining us or tuning in on Friday, January 10th, as we welcome Sandusky City Manager Eric Wobser to discuss the important role small cities play in Ohio. That brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Mayor Whaley. Thank you, members and friends of the City Club, with special thanks to City Club members whose financial support makes our work possible. To find out more about upcoming forums and how you can support City Club, visit us online at cityclub.org. Our forum is adjourned. Have a wonderful weekend. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.